Okay, so welcome everybody to Hoon Academy Lesson 7. This is the next to last lesson of Hoon Academy. We are now in the final stretch of the course. And at this point, we've gotten a good look at the fundamentals of how the Hoon language operates. Let's start this lesson by zooming out and getting a bigger picture of how your Urbit computer is structured. So Urbit is unique among computer systems as a clean slate operating system. The entire system is about 30,000 lines of code that were written largely over the last decade. Um, the system is accessible to read and examine, and one person can even come to understand all the parts of it, hold that in their head, something that cannot be said about any other operating system in use today. Um, as an Urbit user and developer, this can give you a radical degree of autonomy by making your computer something that not only you use, but you can understand and modify to your liking. So let's start here. We're in our dojo, our familiar environment. Let's run bar mount. Let's run bar mount base, send base. We should be familiar with this command. This is going to make our um, files and folders on Mars show up on Earth. Now let's open up the file explorer. One moment. All right. So we're going to go to our fake Zod folder and then go into the base folder. So what do we see here? We see a lot of things. Is there anything we're familiar with in here? Yes. So we've already learned about this gen folder, right? Um, from what we learned, this gen folder is going to contain generators or reusable scripts. We already, in a previous homework, added a new file to here, and then we showed that we could run it from our dojo, right? How about all these other folders? So the lib folder contains library files, which are like utilities that can be imported and used in your other code. The app folder contains the core logic for every app that is installed on your Urbit system. The serve folder contains structure files, which are basically custom types that your apps use. This is basically support for um, your apps. So if you have an app file, usually there's a corresponding serve file in here. The mar folder, um, this contains mark files. And mark files are basically defining the equivalent of file types in, in Hoon. Um, they're like .pdf or .txt. Um, these allow different types of files to be read by Clay, which is the Urbit um, file system. The TED folder contains what are called threads. These are transient computations. Um, we don't need to know too much about them right now, but we will cover these in App Academy. Now, none of the folders um, that we covered here, um, and this test folder is just something that uh, I added. This is not original to the system. So everything that we listed above isn't actually the essential bones of the system that's contained in this sys folder. So if we go in here, what do we see? We see one, two, three, four files that end in .hoon, and then a folder called vein. So what are these files? hoon.hoon, this is maybe the most fundamental one. This contains the code for the language, the compiler, and the standard library. Arvo.hoon. This contains the fundamental event processing machinery of your Urbit ship. Um, this is the, the core of your operating system, basically. Lol.hoon contains some type definitions that Arvo uses. And Zeus.hoon is a user library 
has tools to deal with crypto formatting, JSON, HTML, and other miscellaneous stuff. So each of these files contains a core, and these cores are composed together to form the standard Hoon subject, which is what you access when you're using the dojo. So in particular, if you type some expression in the dojo, such as your dojo expression, that expression is actually being composed with this chain of set hoon.hoon as a subject, then set arrow.hoon as a subject, build that, then build lol.hoon, set that as a subject, then build zoos.hoon, set that as a subject, and then evaluate whatever you put in here. So this is how you get access to the standard library and all these utilities that are defined here. And of course, the, the essential definitions of the language in OS. Um, next, let's go look at the uh, vein folder. So let me bring up the finder again. This vein folder also has some files in it. So what are these? Veins are like kernel modules or discrete parts of the operating system that plug into Arvo and handle different jobs. For example, um, Gall handles Gall agents, which are basically apps. This is the uh, vein for handling apps. Clay handles the file system. Dill handles the terminal or the dojo. And Bane handles timers. These are plug and play. You can actually add new veins. Um, this one, Khan, was actually recently developed and added to the system. This handles um, communication between Urbit and different hardware devices. So let's go out of the vein folder. And as mentioned, this hoon.hoon contains the language, the compiler, and the standard library, basically the backbone of your Urbit system. Let's open it up and take a look inside. So this is a very big file, about almost 14,000 lines. It's one big core. Um, this big core is organized into chapters um, using this uh, LUS bar notation. These are just like notational arms of a core. They don't do anything code-wise, but they just say like, hey, the next arms are part of a chapter in the core. So the remainder of our lesson is going to be taking a leisurely thrill, uh, stroll through, through this um, large file and seeing what we can uncover, seeing what we can learn by looking through here. So um, the first chapter, 1A, chapter 1A of this is going to be um, basic atom arithmetic. So we're very familiar with these. Um, whenever you use add, it's pulling this definition of add from hoon.hoon. This is the code that's run when you run add. Um, dec, reduce an atom by one. Div, dividing atoms by each other. Division with remainder. GTE, comparison, GTH, comparison and so on and so forth. We, we've used a lot of these. The next chapter, 1B, contains what are uh, tree utilities. So what are tree utilities? So these help you um, find addresses in trees, basically. If you'll think back to lesson one, we had a lot of exercises figuring out where things were in binary trees, and these just help with that. Um, for example, this, this gate peg right here, 
What does that do? Um, Peg is going to take two atoms, two numbers, and say, um, suppose you have a subtree at A, and inside that subtree, you want to go to the address at B. So um, that's like saying um, the address uh, less, if you want to find the address less three of the thing at less four in some tree. Right. What what number is that in the whole tree? Well, you'd use peg to find that out. Peg three four. It's going to give you twelve. Um, and that's because if you have a tree like this, go to the three address. Go to the thing at the four address. So if you renumber this, this is one two three four right there. So that twelve is saying. Uh, less four dot less three is going to be less twelve in the whole thing. Does that make sense, everybody? Yep. Cool. Great. All right. Um, there's no questions on that. Then we shall move on with our stroll through. Um, what do Lowell and Zeus add to the subject? Uh. We aren't going to look too closely at Lowell and Zeus, but um, Lowell is basically type definitions used by Arvo. Zeus is user space utilities. So it's just dealing with crypto, dealing with JSON files, et cetera. Okay. So let's continue with our leisurely throw, uh, stroll. Sorry, I'm <laughs> my words today. Our leisurely stroll through um, Hoondot. Okay. So that's chapter 1B. List library, uh, tree libraries. The, the next chapter, chapter 2A, contains unit logic. Now, what are units? Um, so in whom? The character sig, we've seen this character sig before, right? This and we've learned that this is actually the value zero underneath. And we can see that if we cast the sig to a raw atom, we get the number zero. It's it's not exactly a null value because if you look at the raw, raw code underneath this, it's a value that happens to be zero. Um, however, suppose that we want to write a database where we have keys linked to values, right? You look up something and it has an associated value. And sometimes a key may have no value. That means that key doesn't exist in the database. Like say I'm writing an English dictionary and I look up a German word. Um, in that case, the uh, German word key would have no associated value, no associated definition in the English dictionary, right? So. The problem is if we look up a key and we get back this sig, we might be a little confused because is that saying there was nothing there or there was something there and it was a zero? So that's a little ambiguous. Um, in Hoon, this is solved by a data structure called the unit. So formally, UNIT unit is a mold generator, just like list. We learned about list is a mold generator, right? It's a gate that takes as input some type, and then it creates a new mold, creates a new type. That type is a type union of either just sig or a cell of sig and something of that input type. So let's let's see an example of this to make it clearer. Um, so if we wanted to make a unit of a path P, we would just do this. That returns a mold. Um, and let's test our unit path P data type. So we can uh, type check just the character sig to unit pat p and it will pass 
we can also type check a cell of SIG and the PAPP value sample telnet to this type. That will also pass. However, if we just cast only sample telnet to this type, it will fail because this is not a valid unit. Okay, so chapter 2a contains libraries for working with units. Um, the library arm sum lets you put a value in a unit. It's pretty simple. So if you do call sum on sample palnet, then you get a unit containing sample palnet. Um, if you have a unit, and you need to extract the value out of it, you can use need. So you call need on this unit, which contains sample palnet, and then you get the value out of it. If you call need on an empty unit, you're gonna get it crashed. Um, there is a sugar syntax to put something into uh, something unit-like which is just this tick. If I just put a single tick in front of something, that makes a cell of sig and that thing. Um, however, you do want to be careful because recall that um, with null terminated tuples like one, two, three, sig, we learned that even though this is shaped like a list, it's not necessarily known to be a list unless you explicitly cast it to such. Um, and the same thing goes for this and units. Um, this is not necessarily a unit, but it can be a unit if you cast it. There's one more useful utility we should learn for working with units, and that's bind. So suppose you want to apply a gate to a value in a unit, but you don't need to, uh, you don't want to unwrap the unit, grab the thing, and then get the result and then wrap it back in a unit, right? That's a series of operations. Um, bind takes care of that for you. So bind uh, takes a unit and any gate. If the unit is sig, it's just gonna return sig. Otherwise it applies the gate to the value in the unit and then returns the result wrapped in a unit. So here's an example. We call bind on the cell of two, three wrapped in a unit, and then we call add on that, then we get the value five wrapped in a unit. And if we call bind on an empty unit, we just get sig. Basically, it makes gates operate in the world of units rather than in the world of raw values. Um, there's a lot more unit utilities, but um, we don't have the time to cover them in depth right now. All right. So are there any questions on units? Okay, so if there's no questions, we will continue marching onwards through whom dot whom. Um, chapter 2b is the list logic library. Um, it contains things like snap, weld, uh, sort, um, all, all these that we learned to use in, um, in lesson four, working with lists, right? So we are familiar with chapter 2b. Uh, chapters 2c and 2d deal with bits or manipulating data stored in raw zeros and ones. Um, we don't need to go too deep into that right now, but there's um, it's like if you're XORing bits, if you're anding bits, zeros and ones, if you're uh, practiced in other areas of computer science, you may be familiar with these. Um, so chapter 2H contains a uh, set logic. So first we need to know what are sets. So I have a uh, uh, allegory for you. So suppose you're throwing a big party 
and you want to keep track of who to invite. As the day of the party approaches, you keep adjusting the list, maybe adding some people, removing some people. And suppose you're keeping track of this on your computer, maybe in an urban app. Now, if, if your urban app use a list to keep track of this data, um, lists are non-unique, right? Um, a list can, can contain Alice twice. So if you accidentally put Alice twice, maybe your uh, app would send her two invites on accident. We'd like to have a data structure that stores each unique piece of data once and only once. Um, so for these kinds of applications, sets are very useful. A set is an unordered grouping of data, unordered lists are ordered, sets are unordered. Um, and each entry in a set is unique. Um, it can only appear once. So like the other data structures we've seen, the term set in Hoon is a mold generator. It takes as input a mold and returns a type, a mold, which is a set of the input. So for example, if we want to create a type that is a set of tapes, we would just call date set on the mold tape. So let's construct a set. Um, we can construct a set using the library gate SY. SY is going to take a null terminate tuple and creates a set with those elements. So I'm going to take this code here, give it to you guys. What are we doing? We are we're saying call SY with a null terminate tuple of the tapes Alice, Bob, Charlie, Alice, Dave, and a sig at the end. And then cast that result to a set tape. Just to make sure the type is correct. And here we get this set printed out with Alice, Dave, Bob, Charlie. And notice how Alice appeared twice in the input null terminated tuple, but only appeared once in the set. If we didn't cast this to a set tape, what we actually see is um, the raw data structure underneath. This is the same, but this is just formatted much more nicely, much easier to read, right? Um, these N, L, and R, these refer to the underlying tree structure, which are actually used to store these types of data in whom. Um, you don't have to worry about that too much, but that's what those mean. All right. Any questions on that? So <clears throat> there's a lot of utilities available to work with sets, but we have to get used to a new pattern for um, using this library. So let's take a quick detour to something from last lesson. Recall that in last lesson, we learned about a door which could build a gate representing any linear equation of the form y equals ax plus b, right? And that, that code looked like this. I'll put the code in the chat for you guys. And here's the breakdown of the code. So on the outside of the door, it has a sample of two pat UDs, a and b. That door has a single arm buck. And it has this in that buck arm definition. Um, this is a gate in that arm. That gate takes a sample, which is a single pat UD, which we call X. Um, that gate has a cat hap to ensure that the output of this gate must be a pat UD. Um, in its definition, it also uses A and B from the outer door, and it computes AX plus B. So we can name the store linear, 
let's here's the door. We call it linear. Then we're going to use send sig. We're going to say, let me call this buck arm. Let me call this arm of this door linear. Would the sample for two? Now it's going to build this gate with four substituted in for A and two substituted in for B. This output represents the equation 4x plus 2. We haven't evaluated that equation yet. So what we can do is we take this code, we build this 4x plus 2 gate, and then we call that on x equals 1. And then we get this output 6, right? So this is all from last lesson, but the reason why we went through this again is because we're going to use a very similar pattern now. So there's a set library door called in, I N. And that is a door which takes a set as a sample, and then its arms build gates that let you work on that sample set that you gave it. So Suppose we wanted to add a new person to our party set. We can use the put arm of the in uh, set door. All right. So here's our code. We're doing SY, Alice, Bob, Charlie, Alice, Dave. We're making a set and we're calling that party. And then we're casting to a set tape of the result of calling put in party with Edward. So what does this mean? So we're calling the put arm of the in door with the sample party, that this party that we created, this set that we created. This expression builds a gate, and that is a gate that takes an element as input and returns a set with the element added. So this gate that's created here is taking Edward as input and returning this set with Edward added. So we press enter and we get Alice, Dave, Edward, Bob, Charlie. So what if you need to delete someone from your set? Um, maybe last time Dave was at the party, he threw up and set things on fire. Um, unfortunately, we need to take Dave off the list. Uh, we can use the del arm of the indoor to remove him from the set. So here's the code. And same things happen. So let me clear this for better legibility. Okay, so calling psi on this null term a tuple to create a set. We're calling that party. We're casting some result to a set tape. Del in party. So we are calling the del arm of the in door with sample party. That expression returns a gate. That gate takes an element and returns this sample set with that element removed. So we're calling this gate with this input. And we press enter, we get the set with Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Any questions on that so far? By what logic are set items ordered? Um, they're ordered basically according to the construction, um, the, the underlying construction of the tree structure, which I do not know the details of at the moment. Um, but it basically seems kind of arbitrary because there's like some tree creating logic going on underneath. Yeah, there's there's no there's no order. There's like it, this like printing is a bit um can be a bit of a misrepresentation because this makes you think there's an order Alice Bob Charlie but there's official there's like no order underneath to this data yeah that's correct all right so suppose we need to check if somebody has been invited to our party 
we can use the has arm of the in door. Um, so if we call this has arm with the in door with the sample set, that creates a gate. This gate takes an element and returns a send.y if it's in the set and a send.n if it's not in the set. Um, Hermes says, can we create tuples inside the sets to order them? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but you can create a set of tuples. You can create a set of like one, two, three, uh, two, three, five, whatever. Um, um, does that answer your question? Anyways, uh, has, so we're trying to check if something is in our set. So we create this party set as before. Oops. We're saying um, call the has arm of the indoor with our party set as a sample. This creates a gate. We pass that gate Frank to see if Frank is in our set and it gives us a no. And if we repeat that code with Alice, it's going to give us a yes because yes, uh, Alice is in the party set. We can convert a set to a list using tap. So this is a bit different than the previous ones. When we call the tap arm of the indoor with a set, it's going to just directly return that set of lists. This doesn't return a gate that gives you the result. This directly gives you the result. So um, create the set as before. Tap in party, cast it to a list of tapes, and we get this data as a list again. And now notice that if you have a list and you pass it to SY, and then you use tap in to convert it back to a list, that returns the original list with um, anything, any duplicates removed. So that's like a neat trick. If you ever need to remove duplicates from a list, pass it to a set and pass it back to a list. Darsa Labrum says, if you need order, use a list. Yes, that is correct. If you need order and if you um, maybe want duplicates, or you can also have a list and enforce there's no duplicates. Um, but yes, if you want order data, you should use a list. That's correct. There's also some, like, some more tricks you can do with sets. So run is like, um, map. We can apply some gate to every element of a set. If we call the run arm of the indoor with a, with a set as a sample, that returns a gate. That gate takes a gate and applies that gate to all the elements of this input set. So here's an example. We're going to use run on all the elements of this set, which are tapes, with cuss, which capitalizes a tape. So now we get our party invitations, but uh, capitalized. So there's a lot more set utilities. Um, we can't cover them all entirely, but I did want to give you a taste of what's going on and what's possible, um, what's afforded by the standard library. All right, any remaining questions on sets? Okay, so if there's no questions, we shall be moving on. Chapter 2i of the standard library in Hoon.Hoon contains map logic. So key value pairs or dictionaries or maps are really important constructs in any programming language. They let you store data under a name and then search for it later by looking up the name. So in Hoon, this data is implemented with maps. As before, uh, the term map is a mold builder. It takes as input two molds, and it creates a mold, which is the first one as a key and the second one as a value. So this code right here 
is going to create a map, a, a type which is a map from Pat T to Pat UX. Clear this dojo. All right. So let's make a map and do some stuff with it. Suppose that um, we're making an app and we need to store and render some colors to display on the front end. Let's make a map from Pat T text colors to their hexadecimal representations. So the library gate my, my, takes a null terminated tuple of pairs, pairs of key and value, and then it creates a map from them. So here we're going to run my of a null terminated pairs red, hexadecimal for red, green, hexadecimal for green, blue, hexadecimal for blue. All right. We press enter and we get the structure. So again, um, just like sets are implemented underneath with a tree-like structure. And this is just showing that like raw data underneath. Um, but this is the how maps are printed basically. So there's Unfortunately, there's not a way to get, get it to look nicer than that. Um, but we can verify that this is indeed a map from pat t to pat ux by using cat hat map pat t pat ux. And then, oops, sorry. Cat hat map pat t pat ux. And then our code to make the map and it passes the type check. All right. So how do we use this map to put values in it, delete values, and look things up? So just like with sets, there's a standard library door for working with maps called by. And as with the set library door, um, it's a door whose arms build the gates, and those gates operate on the map you gave it. So let's put a new entry in our colors map. So here's a code. We're going to do my of these things. Let's call it colors, tisfaz colors. And then we're going to call the gate produced by put by colors. And remember, this is calling the put arm of the by map library door with the sample colors, which is our map that we created here. That creates a gate. We call that gate on this new pair of yellow and the hexadecimal for yellow. Press enter, and we get a map with the pair of yellow and its color stored in it. We can remove an element from our map with del. So that, again, del is an arm in the by door. We call this door with a sample of colors, and this expression produces a gate. That gate takes a key and returns this sample map with that key's entry deleted. So let's see it in action. Um, So we're making our colors map as before. We're calling the gate produced by del by colors on the key green. Press enter, and we get a map that only contains blue and red. Um, if we pass in a key that doesn't exist in the map, such as orange, if we have this colors map with red, green, blue, and we do del by colors orange, then just returns the original map unchanged. We can look up something with the, the arm get. So the get arm of the by map library door um, 
use this sample, which is a set. This creates a gate, which takes a key and returns a unit of the value if the key exists and this sig empty unit if it doesn't exist. So here we're using the units we learned about before. This is exactly the reason that they're useful because if a key doesn't exist in the map, we're gonna return the sig and otherwise we're gonna return the value in a unit, all right? So I'll give you, that, give you guys this code again. We're creating this colors map as before. Um, get by colors creates a gate which operates on colors. We give that gate the input red. And we're going to get this hexadecimal for red in a unit. If we do the same thing, but with orange, we just get this sig because orange did not exist in the map. There's another arm got, which doesn't give you back a unit. It gives you back the raw value, but it will crash if you got, use got to look up something that doesn't exist in the map. So this is, it's preferable to avoid this because imagine if a user crashed their app by looking up something that didn't exist. So you can still see an example of using got though. So here we define our colors map and we do got by colors to create a gate that operates on colors. Give that gate the input red. And we get this hexadecimal. We do the same thing with orange, which doesn't exist, we get dojo when expression failed. Um, there's a few more useful things that we can do. I'll go through them quickly. Tap by colors. Um, you can directly return the map as a list of pairs. So here we have a list of green, blue, red, and its associated value. We can val by colors to return a list of only the values in the map. And we can use key by colors to return a set of only the keys. And it's, it's useful as a set because in a map, you know that the keys are going to be unique, right? There wouldn't be two keys pointing to different things in a map. Here we get red, blue, green in a set. So just like with lists and sets, there's a lot more utilities for working with maps. Um, however, we don't have time to cover all of them right here. So any questions on working with maps? Okay, so there's no questions. We'll be moving on. Onwards through the standard library. So chapter 2N is called Functional Hacks. Um, this contains useful tricks for modifying the behavior of gates. So um, if you're familiar with other functional programming languages, these utilities are going to look familiar. And if you're not, then no worries at all. We'll explain what they do. So currying is a term for taking a gate and fixing one of its arguments to be a certain value. This creates a new gate that already has one argument passed in. And so it takes one less argument than the original gate. It, that makes sense. So let's see an example of curry. So curry, C-U-R-Y, um, takes a gate and a value, creates a gate with this value substituted for the leftmost part 
of this gate sample. So curry gate val creates a gate. Calling that on BC is equivalent to calling the original gate on val BC. Here, let's do curry mole with 10 and call this mole 10. This is going to be a gate that's going to take one number as an input and multiply it by 10. Then we can call mole 10 on 4, and we get 4. Does that make sense, everybody? So CURR is very similar, except it binds the rightmost part of the sample. So it takes a gate and a value, and it returns a gate with the value substituted for the rightmost part of the sample. Cur gate val creates a gate that if you call it on AB is equivalent to calling the original gate on A, B, and that value see here in the rightmost part. So again, let's show an example of using this. Let's cur uh, GTH, the gate GTH with 10. Um, that's going to take a gate, which uh, that's going to return a gate, which takes one value and compares it to 10. Now we can do GCH 10, 11. Yes. We can also do GH 10, 9. Oops. And we get a no. Does that make sense, everybody? So there's more useful stuff in here. The gate cork composes two gates. So cork takes gate one and gate two and creates a new gate, which calls gate two on the result of calling gate one. So suppose we want to make a gate that reverses a tape and converts it to a chord in one step. So what we do, you cork this new gate we're learning, cuss, remember that's a, that's a gate that takes a tape and capitalizes it. Crip is the one that takes a tape and makes it into a chord. Um, and Give that the tape hoon, and we get capital hoon as a um, as a chord. Um, there's one more functional trick we should learn. Oh, my slide for that is not here. So there's one more functional trick we should learn, and we will just learn it with the dojo. So. Have you ever wanted to call like a gate that takes two arguments on as many arguments as you want? Like instead of just adding two numbers, you want to add up five numbers. You don't want to invoke add five times because that's a lot of typing add, right? You can do that with this mic call room, mic call room. So the first argument to mic call is going to be a gate. Let's do mole. And then it takes however many following arguments as you want. So we we'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you close off this room with this tis tis. And what this is going to do, it's going to apply that mole, which usually takes only two arguments to all of these. And there we've multiplied up all these numbers. This room also has a sugar form, which is just coal left parentheses, this first argument, second argument, third argument, fourth argument, so, so on and so forth. And then we get the same thing. So again, there's a lot, a lot of places that this could be useful. So you need to weld a bunch of tapes together into a big piece of text. You only have to call weld once. All right. 
Any questions on functional tricks in Hoon? All right, so onward we go through the standard library. Um, floating point numbers. So floating point numbers are how computers usually represent numbers that aren't necessarily whole numbers or positive numbers. For example, like negative 3.33, uh, 25.5, pi, so on and so forth. Hoon has several different representations of floating point numbers along with associated libraries. So I'll show you. So let's go to the docs and um, standard library. 3B floating point. So what's going on here? We have a few molds, Fn, Dn, Rn. These represent floating points as broken up into several different pieces of information, such as the sign, positive or negative, the decimal exponent, um, like which represents multiplying it by 10 to the something, and then the actual number. So you ever seen like a calculator number, which is followed by, by like E negative 17, something like that. That means the number is multiplied by 10 to the negative 17, All right? So that just breaks your floating point up into different pieces. There's several pat R auras. And those are storing floating points as a single bit of information. So. Here we have all these different options for how how much information do you want to store your floating point, how precise do you need it to be. So Pat RH is half precision. Half Pat RS is single precision. That means 32 bits of information. Um, Pat RD is double precision, 64 bits. Pat RQ, the most, uh, the biggest one, 100. Uh, 28 bits to store your floating point. Um, with all these options, you can pick and choose what you need when you're working with them. Here's how you would read floating point number in Hoon. So we prepend it with a dot to indicate that we parse this as a floating point and not any other kind of data. This negative right here just indicates that this is a negative number overall. Here's the actual new numerical contents, in this case, 2.5. This is the exponent <clears throat> indicating the decimal position, um, shifting it left or right, multiplying it by 10 to the something. In this case, this negative 3 means we're multiplying this number by 10 to the negative 3. So this number is actually negative 2.5 times 10 to the negative 3 or negative 0 0.0025. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so with all these pat R auras, we have the tools that you would expect to work with them. So um, let's say we wanna to add to pat R, pat RS numbers. We do like this. So we do add col rs, and here are two floating point numbers. 2.5e1 means this is uh, 250. Or, or, yeah, and 2.5e2 means 2,500, because this is 2.5 times 100. Or sorry, this is 25, and this is um, 250. So the result should be uh, 275. Do we need to use exponents, or can we just say 0 point? Yeah, you cannot just say that. But you can just also do 0, 0. 0. 0.0.0025. That's valid. 
I'm going to format it this way. Um, but these are just equivalent representations that it knows how to convert between. Good question. Um, looking back at the syntax here, we call that this coal is actually sugar syntax for this Tisgar. So this expression actually expands to uh, Tisgar, uh, Tisgal, sorry, add RS. This means we're pulling the add arm of this RS core, and this RS core is what contains the utilities for working with Pat RS. You can also divide numbers, div col RS, and we can compare numbers. GTH is 1.2 bigger than 1.1. Yes, it is. All right. Any questions on floating point? Okay. So uh, chapter 3C, Herbit Time, contains a bunch of utilities for working with the PAT DA uh, time format. Um, this is useful if you're making user space apps, and we won't get too far into it right now. Um, chapter 4B contains uh, text processing tools, and we've seen these before. Actually, cuss is in here, pass is in here, um, sane is also in here. Um, these are all in 4B. These are just tools for working with different types of text. And finally, the rest of the stuff, the rest of chapters four through five are mostly about parsing and the Hoon compiler. So um, there's a lot of stuff in there, but it's not too relevant to us at this point in time, unless we're hardcore working on the uh, core system. All right, so that controls up. Uh, that uh, concludes, sorry, our leisurely stroll through Hoon.Hoon, the standard library, the main, uh, the core of kind of the Hoon language. So Darset Labroom says, the names are the same, but the code is in RS instead of standard library. So RS is in the standard library, but um, it's basically the same, like, right. It's, it's basically like if you're doing add one, two, it, it looks basically the same as like add.rs.1.2, except there's some there's some things like pow doesn't actually exist. Um, I learned this recently. Pow col rs doesn't exist. Um, whereas pow exists for pat UDs. So it's not a, always a one-to-one -one correspondence, but pretty much everything you'd expect is in this rs. Uh, library. Franklin says, before we leave numbers, how does Hoon do negative integers? Um, Hoon does negative integers with the pat si aura that's called signed integers. And there is also a, uh, a comprehensive library for working with those in the standard library. We just did not cover it in this, in this short lesson. Yep. All right, so we're coming to the end of the lesson. Um, let's wrap up our discussion by briefly covering some different kinds of syntax you might see in Hoon in the wild. Okay, so we've seen this hat before, which represents the most generic type of any atom, any singular value, right? Um, so that's a pat is a mold which represents any any app. There's a few more of these. So this ket is a mold which represents any cell. Tar is a generic mold for any noun, so an atom or a cell. And that's what this this question mark is a generic mold for any looping, yes or no. So to confirm these definitions, we can bunt these using ket tar to get the default value of these. The default value of an atom is zero. The default value for a cell is a pair of zeros. 
default value for any noun whatsoever is just zero. And the default value for Lubian is send.y. So that just confirms that these single characters are indeed molds. Um, there are a few more uh, uncommon syntaxes, but you'll see these throughout code sometimes. So these look like mathematical operations, but they're actually shorthand for creating cells. So if you do A plus B, like one plus two, uh, that doesn't make three, that makes a cell of send one and two. Um, this first argument should be viable as a pat TAS. And the second argument can be anything. This syntax does the exact same thing. So we can do dog plus the text dash n, and we get this. We can do cat slash text main coon, and we get this same thing. And finally, we have this a cat b, which just makes a cell, normal cell. All right. So that brings us to the end of the lesson. Um, just broadening our knowledge of the, the library and what Hoon has to offer. Um, in the next lesson, we are going to conclude Hoon Academy by showing you how to build production code and giving you a preview of what's next in, in the system as a whole. So uh, I have an anonymous feedback form for you guys, um, and I will conclude the recording here.